Britannia might rule the waves, but not necessarily what lay beneath them. The submarine had arrived as a weapon of war, and its behavior was to become even more ungentlemanly. When war broke out in August 1914, it was assumed that the submarine would be just like another warship, and it would only wage war on the enemy's navy, and it would leave merchant ships alone. War at sea was supposed to be a courteous affair. By the international rules known as the prize regulations, the sinking of unarmed cargo vessels was forbidden. If a ship was found to be carrying war goods, then it could be sunk or captured as a prize and its crew taken prisoner. But the submarine was simply not designed to play by these rules. By early 1915, it was quite clear that the submarine was different. It relied on stealth to survive, therefore it, it dared not linger in the vicinity of a sinking. And so you had this terrible paradox of ordinary young submarine commanders, not particularly wicked people, with no orders from above to be ruthless, were committing the, the gravest sin of all, committing fellow mariners to the sea and leaving them to drown. <laughs> So I think right on day one, the nature of the submarine dictated that it had to, to be successful, it had to be used ruthlessly. If the sinking of merchant ships was considered unsporting, worse was yet to come. Travelers intending to embark on Atlantic voyages are reminded that in accordance with a formal notice given by the Imperial German government, vessels flying the flag of Great Britain or any of her allies are liable to destruction in those waters and that travelers sailing in the war zone do so at their own risk. Published in the newspapers, the warnings of the Imperial German Embassy were ignored as the luxury passenger liner Lusitania departed on what was to be her last voyage. The sinking stunned the world. German claims that the liner was carrying munitions were ignored. As the wreckage washed ashore, America denounced the tragedy as piracy on a vaster scale than any old-time pirate ever practiced. Almost 1,200 people perished. The image of the submarine as a ruthless predator was confirmed. From now on, there would be only two kinds of ships, submarines and targets. Submarines proceeded to wreak havoc on the merchant fleets of both sides, bringing Britain and Germany to the edge of starvation and America into the war. exposed to constant danger, fighting alone in dark waters and under impossible conditions. Conditions in a submarine, well, for more than half a century they hardly changed and they were horrible. In both world wars, submarines were essentially only submersible torpedo boats. They spent most of their time on the surface, hunting for targets, submerging only to attack. But they weren't designed for surface travel. With no keel, they would roll in the slightest seas, water pouring down the open hatch to add to the discomfort of already cramped conditions. This is where the crew lived. Existed would be a better word. It was nothing like this during the war. This deck would be piled high with boxes of food. I'd be crawling along, not walking. Wouldn't only be sailors in these bunks, they'd be pushed full of every kind of gear you can imagine. 
The submarine's systems were designed purely to support its tactical operations, not the comfort of the crew. You slept alongside the torpedoes until you fired them at the enemy, giving you a little more bunk space. The wardroom itself, where the officers lived, was grander, smarter, better decorated. No real comfort in the bunks because you were turning in fully clothed, and furthermore, when you turned out of your bunk to relieve somebody, the chap you were leaving on watch turned into the bunk you just vacated, hence the term hot bunking. Electricity from the batteries was essential for running the boat submerged. Little could be spared for cooking or other comforts. The fumes of whatever was cooked only added to the already offensive atmosphere of diesel fuel and unwashed bodies, the stench of vomit and urine. It was no place for the physically sensitive. Water was vaporized in a still, but only enough to supply the batteries or for drinking. You remove the worst of the grease with gasoline, using a tiny ration of water to clean your face and hands. You never undressed at sea. You remained in the same clothes all the time. And that was because you had to go to the surface at any moment. You might have to go to the bridge at any moment. You might have to go to action stations at any moment. I think what it did was to help bond even further a crew which became an absolutely solid team. Close living conditions do have the effect of ridding you of the barriers between officers and men. In the wardroom, you're not shut away. Anybody can look in. The men see you, that you're all doing the same thing as they do. And in fact, in the, in the tropics, you're all dressed the same. You're probably all just wearing a towel around the middle. It's so damn hot that you can't wear anything else. So there's nothing to judge people by except who they are, what sort of people they are. The relationship between me and my men was one of complete confidence, both sides, both ways. U-boat ace Otto Kretschmer was a household name in Germany in 1940. In 18 months, his U-99 sank more than 300,000 tons of Allied shipping. I knew, and I think everybody else of the crew also knew, that if one of us failed, it could mean the end of the whole submarine and its crew. And so it was a matter of solidarity of all of us. Captain, officers, petty officers, men. It was a band of brothers, really. 